Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Colin Holmes. He's the founder and CEO at Chatmeter. Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you're doing at Chatmeter is actually quite fascinating and you've been around for close to 10 years now. So I'm very curious to hear a bunch of kind of advice and, and things in your journey. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, maybe let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. Uh, I grew up out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, okay. was born in San Jose, but uh, actually I consider most of my growing up in Pleasanton, which is in the East Bay. Uh, nice area. I lived there from about 10 to 20 or so, and uh, then kind of migrated south from there to go to UC Riverside and down to San Diego. I've been in San Diego here for the last kind of 20 years, so nice. this so is my home you... now. Um, <laughs> Nice. So what did you take in university and why? Uh, so here's a really interesting story. So I, prior to um, my transfer, I was actually in my junior college, I was actually an art major, technically photography. Okay. So I studied photography. I went, <laughs> this is a funny story, but <laughs> I wanted to get a uh, job in photography. So I Got it. This is again like 20 years plus years ago. Sure. Uh, I got a job at one of those glamour shots places. If you remember those yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Interesting. So How I was, was that? <laughs> a, I was a photographer there, and became. It was one of the actual. I always date myself with all these stories, but one of the first uh, places where you could actually see your photography right away. They actually had digital oh, wow. uh, images that you could see right after the photo shoot. And so as a photographer there, he was also a salesperson. So he would take the pictures and then sell them the products and they did very well there. And so I got promoted up to be a salesman, I'm sorry, to be a store manager. I think it was 19 years old and I was the youngest store manager ever at their existence and uh, took over this store. I was losing money and uh, the only way I was going to get paid is if I turned the store around. It was actually... Wow. A large component of my of my pay was out of the profit and loss. So I essentially was running the store like it was running the business. And uh, it was that exposure. I kind of finished up my, my um, uh, junior college. And so I had a good year of running the business on a full-time basis and realized not only was I good at it, but I was very interested and excited about the whole concept and, uh, and so it was my, that experience actually that made me change my major before going to, U, to UC Riverside from photography to business. <laughs> okay. No, interesting. That, that makes some sense. And then, um, you ended up going and getting your MBA, correct? Yeah, that was, it was quite a few years later. So, uh, essentially after I, I, I went to UC Riverside, finished up there in a couple of years and then came to San Diego after that, I, uh, I worked at a couple of ad agencies here locally. So I, I basically studied marketing, worked at some ad agencies, and then around 98, 99, uh, when the dot-com boom was happening, I wanted to get into the internet startup scene. And so I started at a company called uh, Interview here in San Diego. Interview was pioneering streaming media. So we're, you know, people are on dial-up connections. Sure. And we're still streaming, you know, uh, we're streaming House of Blues concerts, MTV videos. Very cool. Uh, privately about, privately about half the porn on the web. <laughs> of course, that's where <laughs> the innovation is of any yeah. technology and, and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the company grew. I mean, it was one of those big success stories, right? They grew to about two to three hundred employees. We sold a company called Akamai at the peak of the market for uh, $3.2 billion with wow. a B. Wow. Uh, so it was one of those exciting times. You know, there's a new car in the parking lot every week and all that fun stuff. 
unfortunately, it was probably the worst acquisition ever on paper because, uh, one, you know, a lot of the paper was made up. <laughs> if you remember back in the day, yep. a lot of cooking in the books, but in addition, uh, the dot bomb happened with about, it happened within about probably six or eight months of that acquisition. Interesting. So I didn't have a huge financial exit. I hadn't been there that long. And so I didn't have a huge financial exit, but it got me excited about startups and the tech space and what can, you know, what can happen, uh, if you're in the right place and right time and make the right decision. Sure. But getting to my MBA, the reason why I got my MBA, one of the reasons I got my MBA is at, when I was at interview, I was growing and growing in terms of career. I kept getting promoted, but I could never get promoted to a director level because they all said, you know, everybody at director level and above has an MBA here. And so I had a bit of a, I guess you could say a glass ceiling and recognize that I wanted to go back. And, I should go back and get my MBA, especially because a major recession just hit. Uh, and there were no marketing jobs anymore. So I actually went through, uh, I went back on my MBA. Uh, I got a gig at, uh, AT&T wireless actually selling blackberries. Interesting. So this is back in the blackberry days selling blackberry enterprise servers. So it was an enterprise sales gig, uh, which was good because it gave me, you know, as a marketer, I think it's very valuable to actually have sales experience. Oh, totally. You know, people, going out and doing, you know, 60, 70 sales calls a day and all this challenges with carrying a quota, you know, and all the stress that goes along with that uh, is quite an eye opener when you're a mark, you know, when you're a marketer and you're just kind of creating messaging and creating content and, and you're not really feeling the pain of uh, what it's like to actually convince a customer uh, to sign up. <laughs> yeah, very much so. So walk me through the rest of your kind of career and how did you come up with the idea of chat meter and what exactly is it? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, as I was, uh, essentially studying marketing in my MBA, uh, at the end of that tale, it was, it was about, a, I think about two years to finish my MBA. I got, I was just required to do a, um, thesis project. And so I picked a startup in town called V Enable. This was in San Diego and okay. uh, V Enable actually stood for Voice Enable. So I, I started working on a project. Uh, I finished my MBA and they gave me a full-time uh, job offer. So I moved, I quit my job at AT&T Wireless. Uh, I moved over to, uh, to V Enable and headed up their product development and marketing for the company. Uh, and it was, you know, the product actually, essentially the company when I first started was, uh, pioneering voice search. So okay, voice search early back on. on the flip phone days, right? This is yeah. like 14, 15 years ago. And at the time, in terms of wireless data services, there were people were only downloading ringtones. Yeah. So when I actually, when I first started there, we were doing voice search for ringtones, which was crazy. Uh, you know, you could say Britney Spears or whatever, and it would do a search and come back with your Britney Spears ringtone. Uh, but we realized pretty quickly, uh, one, the ringtone space was, was changing dynamically in terms of going from ringtones to full, you know, song ringtones or whatever, and that cut out the middleman and all this other stuff. So we had to do our own pivot. Uh, and so we decided to pivot into uh, local search. Okay. So... We pivoted the company mostly because voice search for local made a lot of sense, right? You're on the go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't want to type. It's an older demographic because, you know, local search should hit everybody. Sure. Uh, so they're more likely to say something rather than type something in. And so, yeah, it was pretty hilarious. We had, uh, you know, just like you can do on your phone today, this is, again, 14 years ago on a flip phone, you could say Starbucks. We would record that search. We would send that off to a server to do voice recognition processing. We would then take that and send it to another server to go and get the local search results. Wow. Finally, within about like 14 or 15 seconds, you would see, you would see the Starbucks on, on a map on your little flip phone. Which was pretty, uh, pretty cool hilarious to think about to compared prepare, today. Right? <laughs> that was pretty fast was back in the day. So I, it's funny you mentioned that because when I tell this story, I often think about 
uh, a party that we threw in a huge celebration uh, when we broke what we called the 10 second barrier. Sure, I can imagine. <laughs> so yeah. we, got it, we got it below 10 seconds. We thought that was amazing. Uh, but, you know, the challenge was, you know, flip phones were not still, you know, it was limited in terms of uh, data services and data adoption. We had a white label strategy. So we were, you know, powering up, uh, you know, local search for Verizon and AT&T and they would preload it on the device. Interesting. So we were doing well in generating, you know, good revenues. Uh, around 2008, uh, the iPhone comes out, which is good for us because obviously it's going to, smartphones are going to power uh, data services and data adoption yep. uh, in local search. The, the problem for that business, though, is was our white label business model, right? So no one's going to care about a Verizon local search app. Right. They're just going to use what's evolved, right? Google Maps at the time with Foursquare was big. Yeah. Uh, they're going to use whatever you know app they prefer, uh, and no one's going to care about that. So the company actually pivoted again. This is around 2009. I. I've uh, been there for, I think, four or five years. I was vice president of product development and marketing. Uh, they decided they were going to move to the Bay Area, raise some more money, do a pivot, and go into mobile advertising. And I'd been through, like, obviously, two or three pivots with them already. Sure. Said, uh, I'm good. I'm going to stay here in San Diego and open up my own gig. Uh, when I was there as vice president, I was involved in board meetings and raising capital and all those things. So that really was the business. Uh, in the startup, that gave me the confidence to go out and do my own thing. Interesting. And being so, a local search, I recognized, uh, you know, at the time, local search had less than, you know, probably around 5% adoption in mobile local search. Sure. But I, with smartphones, I anticipated that was going to change or forecast it. So I knew there was a new marketing channel that was invention, that was essentially emerging, right? Okay. So uh, this was going to be important for customers with physical locations. This is going to be the key way in which customers are discovering, you know, their business and finding out about it and deciding if I'm going to go here or there. And that reviews were going to have a huge impact on that, just like reviews did on the, in the online space and e-commerce, you know, with Amazon and others, I it was anticipating that reviews would have a huge impact on, uh, on local search. And so I came up with the concept of chat meter. Okay. Uh, brainstormed the name out of nowhere. I think I was, looking at different things like buzz and buzz meter and others, right. but you know, was, was focused on making sure I could get the dot com as well. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, fair enough. I came, yeah, that's a key ingredient. Uh, so came up with a name. Uh, it was a little off on the target market originally. So this is right around, by the way, by 2000, end of 2009, I started uh, fiddling around with the idea and the business plan and all that. Uh, okay. And at the time, everything, every, people were all talking about, at least in the, in the dot-com tech space, we're talking about freemium. So freemium was a big area of, you know, our big business model that people were pushing. So I built a, a freemium to small business offering, uh, which is essentially the same thing that we do today around kind of, you know, uh, local SEO and reputation platform, just, it was designed for small businesses. So imagine, you know, we we're having a, you know, mom and pop restaurant owner sign up on our website. They would get a um, simple PDF report. It would show them like, here's how you're doing in terms of reviews and what customers are saying and how that compares with your competitors down the street. Uh, okay. Here's how, you know, if your business listings are accurate and all the kind of the components that go into uh, local search and reputation and then get them to try and move to a uh, dashboard as a full service paid offering. Right. So it's kind of the premium upsell. Uh, banged my head against that wall for about <laughs> three or four years. <laughs> okay. Uh, Interesting. You know, the challenge with, you know, it's a challenging thing for many uh, entrepreneurs because people get very excited about the idea that there's about 30 million small businesses out there. So yeah. they think about, oh, if I can get, you know, one, two percent adoption, I'm going to have an amazing company and make a ton of money. Yeah. Uh, but getting to that point is incredibly difficult. And uh, the reasons why that I learned the hard way, uh, SMB owners are knowledge starved, especially within tech, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, they are 
money starved, right? They don't yeah. have huge marketing budget. They yeah. are time starved. You know, they're re- working 70, 80 hours a week already. They typically don't have a time, a lot of time to deal with this stuff. And then uh, they have their own churn problem. So if you look at about a third, it's pretty amazing to think about this volume. There's 30 million SMBs out there. A third of them go out of business every year. Interesting. And a third open up every year. Interesting. So if, you, if you're starting to build a recurring revenue model or SaaS model on top of something, you know, churn is a very important issue. So if you have high churn, you're always just replacing your revenue, right? So it's really hard to outpace uh, if you have a churn problem. And if you're building on top of a market in which you already have a 30% churn with their own business, uh, it makes it even more difficult to make sure you have strong retention rates. So uh, needless to say, after doing that from, I think I launched in 2010, so about 2013, uh, you know, it, it was uh, it was pretty tough going. It was very, you know, it was a bootstrapper, a bootstrap in the business with very little funding. I basically took my entire life savings that I had saved up, including my 401k, which I don't recommend selling, but I did have to get, sell that as well and put every dime I had into the business for the first few years. I had done, you know, mostly software development is all done with India outsourcing. I got you. In my previous company, we were using India uh, software developers. So I was pretty familiar with building requirements and, and actually getting good product out of it. If you know what you're doing, if you don't sure. know what you're doing, that's a big lesson learned uh, that I hear from a lot of other entrepreneurs. Like uh, if you send over your, you know, your concept and requirements and hope in six months, you're going to get a great product back. Uh, unless you babysit that every day, you, that's not what's going to happen, right? There's going to be yeah. miscommunication and all those other elements. So that was, you know, one of the other big challenges is, you know, as I was bootstrapping this business, I was typically working 80 to 90 hours a week, uh, and often up till three, four or 5 a.m. in the morning. Cause I was talking with India. Sure. Wow. So incredibly difficult. Uh, certainly the hardest thing I ever did put all my life savings into it within probably two to three years. I had, you know, run dry. I, I was broke, wow. went out and did a little friends and family round. So, you know, tried to tap a little bit of that. That helped us survive for probably another like six or eight months. Wow. Uh, and then it was a big decision time, right? Now, what am I going to do next? Uh, I knew I wanted to pivot toward enterprise and kind of pivot the business toward multiple location. Okay. But we're running low on funding, you know, uh, revenues were coming in, but not nearly as much to really kind of grow the business. Uh, we had gotten into uh, one of the big incubators here in San Diego. So uh, over the first couple of years, I started working with some advisors okay. and those advisors had got us into some, uh, got me into one incubator in town. That incubator helped us get introduction to some angel investors and that was really when i you know started talking to angel investors and raised our first little angel round which frankly was tiny okay i think our first angel round was forty five thousand dollars okay. sure. <laughs> a couple yeah. checks from a couple of wealthy individuals <laughs> <Got you. laughs> uh but what that did is two major things one uh and one of those angel investors actually introduced me to my current CTO, uh, Paul Coach. Okay. Uh, it was an amazing addition to the company. You know, uh, prior to that, I had, you know, some kind of more contractor uh, engineers that were helping us and obviously a lot of India development. Right. He came in and, and saw there was a huge opportunity to build a real product here. He recognized we were pivoting toward enterprise. Uh, so there's a lot we were going to have to build and so, uh, you know, great opportunity. So he took a massive, you know, pay cut to come work for us. Interesting. Uh, in addition, I also, uh, found my current head of sales who, uh, I actually found through a job ad on Craigslist, uh, wow. is where we're looking for a salesperson. Wow. And, uh, he came in, uh, and has also been really a game changer on the sales side again pivoting toward multiple location, we had to figure out, you know, how we're going to sell, what the sales mix is going to be, what the message is going to be, what that PowerPoint deck is, like all those components to kind of change the model and, and find a solution that would work and that would scale. 
So both of those guys have been a tremendous addition to the company. We relaunched in January of 2015. Okay. With this new enterprise product, enterprise again, meaning multiple allocations. So instead of a small business, uh, now, you know, we require you must have at least 20 locations for us to even talk to you. Our typical gotcha. client has about 50 to 500 locations. Gotcha. Uh, but essentially, we relaunched that product offering in January of 2015, uh, and the company has just skyrocketed ever since then. So nice. Uh, we just hit the, uh, we were in the top Fortune 1000. Uh, we had a 750% revenue growth since 2015. Wow, congrats, man. That's huge. Uh, so really exciting. We actually just hit the top 10 of the fastest growing SaaS companies in the world as well. Wow. So the business has been uh, growing like crazy, and it's been a fun and exciting ride. We're up to about uh, 80 employees here in San Diego uh, wow. and just doing really well. Congrats, man, on all that. That's great. So an <laughs> overnight 10-year success, right? That's how it's described? <laughs> I call it a five-year overnight success is what I would say. But yeah, the no, first five I, years are pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, no, I, fair enough. I, I think that's the funny thing about the whole space, right, is so many people think that you just put up a website or your, your little SaaS app and you're going to make a lot <laughs> yeah. of money, right? Well, it takes years, right? So... Yeah. I'm curious I mean, there. most VCs, they Go say ahead. now the average business, the most VCs will say the average time it takes to build a business is about 10 years. So yeah, it's not the world, you know, back when it was 2000 or 2001, and everybody was, you know, they would build a business and they would flip it in a couple of years and they would, yeah, they were selling it for crazy amounts of money. Uh, that's not happening anymore, right? The, the whole yeah. world has, has become more realistic that, you have to go out, you have to acquire customers and you have, that's a very difficult process. You know, anyone can build anything in my opinion. So yeah. that's the world of software today. Like anyone with the right amount of money can build anything. That's not the hard part. The hard part is acquiring and retaining customers. Yeah. That's where the challenge comes in. Makes sense. So walk me through the platform a bit. How do these organizations use the platform and what types of features and sure. kind of functionality do you guys offer? Yeah, so what Chaminer is is uh, essentially a uh, local SEO and local search and reputation platform for multiple locations. So imagine a chain, for example, like uh, uh, and we just closed Payless recently, right? Payless has 2,800 nice. stores. Uh, they utilize our platform for a couple things. One, you know, uh, one is responding to all the reviews that come in on those local search sites. So when people are yeah. posting reviews on Google Maps, on Yelp, uh, and other platforms, Facebook, et cetera, we pull all that data into our dashboard. We send them live email alerts. So on a daily basis, they uh, understand what the customers are saying in terms of that customer experience. They can utilize our dashboard to respond. Okay. And... Um, the other elements, we pull in all of their kind of social data as well. So anything around Facebook and Twitter, we're doing social listening. We also uh, have now added uh, media and image monitoring. So okay. uh, that really has become the reviews of today. People are posting pictures if it's a restaurant or in their experiences uh, or if it's their new kicks. That's an outdated term, I think. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> if it's their new kicks on Payless. Uh, they might be posting those on Instagram. So we pull all that information in. Sure. Uh, but you get the idea. So it's monitoring that information. And then we also take all of that content um, through our site. We have what's called a sentiment analysis engine. So it may be looking at the thousands of reviews across, uh, across Payless or, uh, you know, one of our restaurant clients like Chili's and understanding what the customers are essentially saying across all these reviews. Where do you need to improve? If it's uh, Chili's, for example, you know, in the Southwest region, is it wait times? Is it uh, food quality? You know, is it the waiters? Do you need to fire the store manager? Right. Those types of elements that help them from, you know, help them to improve the customer experience. So that's why I think that's one of the main reasons why our retention rate is really high because it's not only utilized by marketing in terms of the presence, uh, but it's also used by operations in terms of improving the customer experience. 
and regional managers, you can monitor their stores and see which ones are doing well, which ones are not. And again, if they have to go fire the store manager, <clears throat> so you get the concept there. At the end of the day, by doing all of these things, by responding to reviews, uh, we also help them clean up their business listings and make sure the name, address, and phone number is correct across the web for all those stores. By doing those things, that does a couple things. One, it helps them increase their rankings. Sure. So they're going to get more stores in front of more consumers when that consumer is searching for kids' shoes or uh, or restaurants. Mm-hmm. In the examples I gave, um, in addition, their listings are enhanced. So they'll typically have photos, right? They'll have descriptions that share what that experience is. So it's more likely that a customer is going to click on that. Uh, and what's also exciting is, you know, we power a very, pow- you know, uh, important space for our customers. Okay. Because typically when consumers are searching, they're looking to go out and make them purchase. Right? Yeah. We are at that last mile transaction. So if you look at the data, uh, local searches, uh, for every local search, I think uh, 76% of the time, customers will go and make a purchase within 24 hours. Interesting. So by playing in that space and influencing that space, uh, we have a very powerful play and a tremendous ROI for our clients as well. Interesting. The the one thing that I want to get a little bit more information about um, that we haven't covered yet is your competitor monitoring. How do you do that? Because I think that's kind of really fascinating piece of the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So, that's one of the most probably important and relevant things that we do sure. for our customers. Because if you imagine, let's say, well, let's see, we work in the automotive space quite a bit too. So imagine okay. you're an automotive dealer and you tell that automotive dealer, hey, you've got a 3.8 rating and say 400 reviews. Okay. He's thinking, hey, that's pretty good, right? I'm golden. Like, I, I don't need to worry about anything. Uh, but if you then show them that the competitors down the street, the other dealerships down the street have say a 4.2 rating yeah. and 2000 reviews. Now I have a problem, right? So not only are you driving that, you know, need to want to be the best in your area, that also shows that you're lagging in terms of, um, rankings and in terms of where you're showing up in search results. Sure. Because reviews have a huge impact on that. There's a bunch of elements that goes into the Google Maps algorithm, consistency of your name, address, and phone number for all your for your location. There's a bunch of elements that play into that. The point being is it's all you've got to always outpace your competitor. Right. That's how you're going to be number one, and that's how you're going to drive the most customers. And having that insight into what your competitors are doing is incredibly powerful uh, as well. Yeah, no, that that's actually really quite fascinating because you're right. I, I think even selfishly, I know sometimes if you're looking up a restaurant or a business to go buy something and they have less mm-hmm. than like a four out of five star rating, you think twice about it, right? And then sometimes you might even start reading the reviews because sometimes you get just people that are, you know, jerks about reviews. Like I remember reading um, a bad review mm-hmm. about a hotel and it was the box spring didn't match the mattress. And I kind of thought, really? You <laughs> gave them a crappy re- And why would you even look at that? Yeah. Right? So like stuff like that sometimes, but they were getting a bad rating because of that. And I thought, okay, but yeah. it makes you second guess the second you see a bunch of kind of like one star reviews or something like that. So that is quite fascinating to me. Um, well, it is. I mean, it is interesting because you bring up a common mis. mis- perception is that uh, we have a lot of clients who uh, and really a lot of people in the industry who just feel like all the reviews are negative. Yeah. Uh, They feel like reviews are just something that are there for people to complain. But when you actually look at it at an aggregate level, the wide majority of reviews are actually positive. Most people like to, uh, you know, if they have a great experience then they have no problem going on and posting a great experience. So, The majority of reviews, if you look at it from an aggregate basis, is close to a four-star rating today and continues to actually improve over time. Sure. And that's across, I know that data point because we have, uh, you know, about 30 million reviews now on our platform. Wow. 
or in our database, I should say. So, yeah, so we have a ton of aggregate data of what's going on in the local search space and local search industry across reviews and listings and rankings. It's uh, it's pretty powerful. We've tried, we're tracking over about 2 million locations as of today. Wow. So do you guys suggest how to get people to leave more reviews or more positive reviews or how does the <laughs> platform kind of actually help people improve their kind of standing across all the different platforms? Yeah. Uh, so there's multiple ways of doing that. One of which is just even starting to engage with your customers is actually okay. driving reviews. The other is, uh, so there's, we see that in our platform, as soon as you start responding, it's actually generating other customers because they start to see that activity going on on the page, on your Google, My, Google Maps page or on a Yelp page right. and start posting because they, people love, you know, engaging. Sure. Uh, in addition, as you roll it out as a company, typically they're educating everybody across the company how important reviews are. So at the local level, people start to start asking for reviews. You know, people are running contests in many cases where, you know, again, if it's Chili's, imagine a Chili's location, uh, the store manager will run a competition to see which waiter can get mentioned the most, uh, you know, in reviews for a month. Sure. You know, so they're doing a lot of things of engaging with customers. Uh, we, we Hopefully they're not bribing people because that is kind of a no-no in our industry. Sure. Uh, you do see that in some cases. I'm sure, sure. we've all had our, yeah. you know, mover ask us or bribe us to, yeah. to get reviews. That's definitely frowned upon in our industry, so we don't recommend that. Uh, but, you know, really it's about creating awareness uh, and just keeping a focus on it. Right. Well, the other thing too, and I've seen it even just when you're in like an app store or something or a, a review, it's people just want a resolution and then they're willing to turn their negative review into a positive review yep. if you rectify their issue, whatever it is. Yeah, it's really exciting that you can see that right within our platform. So okay, interesting. Uh, typically people will engage with that negative review. They'll respond, say, you know, I'd love to resolve your issue. Please call me or contact me at this email address. Uh, Cause they don't have a way to like directly get a hold of that person unless they can right. try to figure it out from a customer perspective. But sure. uh, in many cases they will then see, they'll chat with the customer customer will then append the review update it. We keep all that historical data in our dashboard. So you can actually see the customers turning that negative into a positive And then, you know, those are great wins from, you know, the customer care team that's handling all this stuff. Interesting. That makes sense. So really exciting to see that as well. Thanks for listening to Building the Future. This show is heard by more than a million people monthly in over 15 markets worldwide, including Silicon Valley. Kevin Horick's guests are leading business owners, successful entrepreneurs, and merchandisers worldwide. Now, your brand has an opportunity to tap into this dedicated and active group of business people who are looking for places to invest and the right opportunities to support. Find out how you can get involved at buildingthefutureshow.com. So how do you guys decide which new features to roll into the platform? And are you guys constantly adding new platforms or do you kind of wait till they mature a bit? Like, how do you decide that? Because you could potentially be feature creeping and constantly chasing your tail to add new stuff, right? Yeah. That may or may not be relevant. Yeah, it's always an ongoing challenge. We have, uh, you know, a ton of enterprise clients now that are always asking for new features. Sure, so I can imagine. So we have to, we have a whole like process that okay. we built now for evaluating those features. Our product team will evaluate that, look at how many different customers it would apply to. Does it create revenue for us? Is there new revenue opportunities tied behind those features? Sure. There's a whole process we evaluate. Uh, okay. And then sometimes it'll get, it'll get stuck into a queue if that is to get done. And other times we'll have to reject it and give them a reason why. Uh, we can't build everything. That's insane. And uh, we also have to think about UI now because we've added so many features. We have about right. six tabs on our dashboard. Okay. So from a UI perspective, it can get pretty hairy if you start to build too many features in there. I'm sure you've seen the dashboards yeah. that have 20 tabs and then there's like three 
layers yep. underneath each tab. Like it just becomes so exhausting. You don't even know how to use it anymore. Yep. And so you don't use it. No. And that so that it's a very careful, uh, it's a big thing we discuss a lot in some of our product meetings. Sure. Uh, is kind of feature creep and UI and making sure, you know, uh, everything we put in there is vital uh, and drives usage and value. Sure. Well, and I also assume because you're dealing with these large brands, sometimes they're willing to throw money at you to make that happen, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. that can be very mm -hmm. challenging to, to turn down, right? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and it also depends on what stage you're at too, because sometimes sure. you're going to be in a desperate stage where yeah. no matter what, it's early on and you're bootstrapping and you need that money. So you're going to do it anyway. So it's, it's really interesting how that can evolve depending on what stage your company is at. We're, we're at a point now where it's like, we need to only build features that are going to be revenue generating for everyone right, right across uh, an entire industry, uh, not just for one single client. Now sure. being in, enterprise company there is some level of development that we set aside knowing that we're going to have to build different things and how you know some cases uh either from a you know cost opportunity cost perspective great example uh we have one client right now uh who is asking us to do internationalization so yeah. most of our data right now we collect and the services we provide are all in the u.s got you so we have a customer that wants us to uh, supply, su support international clients because they have a lot of chains that are not only in the U.S., but across the world. Makes sense. Uh, Europe, South America, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine the brands that we're talking about. Yeah. And uh, so there's a lot of work that we have to be done. So typically, yeah. we will look at that from an engagement perspective, uh, and you either do upfront costs or additional kind of revenue requirements. Right. So we're happy to build this if within X time period, you know, you're going to add Y revenue. Got you. So that's a great way to, because they don't always get that excited about upfront costs, as you can imagine. Uh, but by committing to that, because they're going to add on services, it's a way to mitigate your risk because even okay. if they aren't able to add it, you know, it's a contract minimum. So those are great ways to, to kind of mitigate the risk and increase your revenue at the same time. Got you. No, that's, that's interesting because it's such a balancing act, right? And yeah, no, that's, mm -hmm. so you've mentioned kind of a handful of industries that you guys work in, but do you want to kind of mention a, a few more and, and maybe give some examples of how people use your platform in those industries? Sure. Uh, Let's see. So we talked, uh, we talked a little bit about restaurants already, uh, retail, I mean, pretty similar components of people responding to reviews and, uh, driving store experiences. I mean, that, I mean, retail is an interesting one because you start to see that shift, uh, back to the stores. So years and years ago, all the retailers are like, Oh, everything's going to e-commerce. So let's yeah. just run all these e-commerce websites and, you know, they pretty much got their ass handed to them by Amazon yeah. uh, in the e-commerce space and, you know, and other channels. So they're starting to recognize they need to refocus on their stores again and get a store experiences that will be their differentiator, right? That's the only way that they're actually going to compete because they can't compete on the margin levels and the, uh, you know, adoption levels of an Amazon and other stores. And so uh, that's been really interesting for them to utilize their dashboard and look at things like, for example, Kohl's as a client was looking at uh, the omni-channel experience. So okay. people that would buy online and pick up in store so they could actually measure those individual clients uh, or customers that were doing what they call BOPIS. Uh, so those are good examples of uh, where customers would be utilizing the platform uh, to look at things like retail as an example. Interesting. Uh, and the, you know, the store experience, other examples, uh, we talked about automotive, so automotive dealer dealers are interesting because it's not only the original shopping experience, but then you have other customer experiences you need to measure in terms of service and support. Yeah, totally. Uh, so they look at the data in different ways and those customer experiences are measured differently. Uh, what else we do a lot in the apartment space, 
Okay. Uh, so customers that are, uh, you know, property managers that are managing properties uh, are utilizing the platform. And they're obviously looking at, you know, what customers are uh, posting from, a, you know, a living experience, right? Are you repairing their stuff on time? Uh, you know, what are the common facilities like? The pool, you know, they keep the hot tub warm, you know, that type of thing. Uh, yeah. But you get the concept of, you know, people are going to look at, depending on what their service offering is, uh, are going to dive into different details. And through our sentiment analysis tool, they can really create topics among whatever is important to their business. And that's how we've kind of kept an industry agnostic tool, which is, probably one of the bigger challenges that most software companies have, you know, uh, how do you serve multiple industries? And, uh, you know, there's challenges because there's people specifically specific in that industry that might build, build a similar, similar tool. So, uh, you know, entrepreneurs can get, uh, pretty focused on a single industry and go down that path, which maybe that is the right decision. And sometimes it's the wrong decision. Yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious, if there's any advice or things that um, you tell people to maybe do or don't do, because you're obviously not a startup anymore. You've kind of made that transition to a real business that's been around for a decade and that's a huge accomplishment. So is there any advice you would give people that are, you know, starting out or or struggling through kind of the early years or months? Um, Mm -hmm. What advice do you give to people like that? Uh, well, a couple things. One, uh, I would say make sure that you go to other, you know, entrepreneurial startup events. I'm sure, you know, almost everybody, depending on what town you're in, obviously, if you're in Toledo, Ohio, that might be more difficult, but sure. most cities will have other, you know, uh, startup events going on. Uh, get involved because it'll help you better kind of uh, understand the, the process as okay. you talk to other people that are going through similar experiences, it's also going to help you with relationships because you'll find people that are going to want to join your team and join your goal and vision. And, uh, you know, that, that are trying to get into the startup space or already maybe have started experience and they're actually just looking for their next gig, uh, sure. or their next, you know, fun thing that they want to do. And, uh, in those cases, sometimes they may, even be coming with capital and have some ability to invest some capital in your business. So uh, try not to go it alone. Uh, I'd probably say that's something that uh, I struggle with the first couple years, uh, you know, as I was sitting in my second bedroom working 90 hours a week and trying to figure out where this company is going and where this product offering is going. Uh, probably could have spent a little more time out on the marketplace uh, and trying to get some additional help, uh, you know, from uh, earlier uh, on than I did. Sure. Or try so to be one example. Sure. Or even just try to Go drive ahead. to an event to a bigger, in a bigger city or fly to a big conference once or twice a year, right? If you're in a Absolutely, smaller city. Yeah, I think that'd be, yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, and also just looking at a lot of online research. So there's an amazing amount of information now that's available about how to set up your SaaS company for this or that, or how do you, uh, you know, put together a board, what should you be compensating your CTO, how much shares should you give away? Like all those components, there's so much data available now. Uh, It's incredibly valuable to, uh, to start putting together, you know, your own, not only business model, but how you're structuring the business. Uh, itself. So I would recommend just make sure you lean on Google as much as possible. It's an incredible asset for starting a business now. I mean, that's what's probably one of the most exciting things is starting a business is cheaper than it's ever been. Sure. Uh, and it continues to go b- down in startup costs. Uh, we've been, we've, we're very capital efficient through the years. Uh, and was pretty unheard of. We got to about a two million ARR business on less than two hundred thousand dollars in funding. Wow, which is uh, pretty unheard of. Yeah, uh, and you know, a little reason why it took a little, it took that five year overnight of success. Sure. Uh, but you know, if I think about it, if we raised a lot of money early on, we probably wouldn't be here 
because we Why were waiting that? for the market to catch up a lot. Oh, so you yeah, remember that market adoption piece, right? So if I went out and raised, you know, uh, five or ten million dollars back in you know 2010, 2011, the market just wasn't there yet. Interesting. There wasn't enough adoption of even mobile local search for businesses to want to pay for some solution. Sure. So uh, essentially, what would have happened is we would have been doing our board meetings and not hitting our revenue numbers, and we would have shut down the business. So Interesting. that's the one area that, you know, I would also recommend, you know, being a bootstrapper, most, there's a lot of uh, capital investment now that are looking specifically at bootstrap businesses and recognizing that those CEOs and those entrepreneurs, those founders essentially uh, went and figured out a business model first. Yeah, interesting. And they figured out, you know, how to make some money at this before even building, you know, a full core product, you know, uh, following all the lean startup philosophies and executing on that uh, makes for a pretty lean, mean organization. Uh, And that's where later on you can raise additional capital and give away much less to your company. Yeah. And that's what we've done here at Chapmeter. Interesting. No, I I think that's actually quite fascinating. And that's actually really good advice because I think so many people nowadays figure they need to raise, you know, millions of dollars to launch. And it it just seems crazy to me in a lot of situations and cases, unless you're building something, I don't know, like a medical device or or you need drug testing or something like that. Right. That's just, right. But the fact that you can build an entire SaaS business for not a lot of money um, is, is really good advice. Yeah. So we're kind of at the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and chat meter. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of information about me online. I have a bunch of interviews on there. Uh, if you go my name and chat meter, they have some pretty cool videos going on over the years, but, uh, you can also reach out to me directly if you want to. I'll just leave my email, which is Colin at chatmeter.com. C O L L I N. Uh, I can't say I will get back to you immediately. My inbox is pretty, pretty flooded most of the time, but I would try to get back to you. Uh, and of course, you can learn anything about Chatmeter at our website, which is just chatmeter.com. Perfect, Colin. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. Okay, great. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and again, if you need anything, feel free to reach out. Will do. Thanks, man. Okay, bye. bye. All right, bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community. Sign up for our newsletter or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.